Next up, we have our first panel of the day, which is going to look into another crisis that's deeply entwined with the disparities from COVID-19, and this is the challenge of chronic disease. In the United States, more than half of uh, US adults live with a chronic condition, and it's been very well documented that chronic conditions dis disproportionately impact communities of color, low-income communities, other uh, different communities across the country, and as a result have placed those communities at the higher risk of severe uh, COVID-19. And so the panel is going to explore how we can begin to reverse that trend. And I'll now turn it over to our moderator, Samantha Ortega. She is the director of the Racial Equity and Health Policy Program at the Kaiser Family Foundation. She's going to lead this discussion. Thank you so much, Dean Levin. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from today. Um, as was mentioned, today's panel is going to be focused on America's chronic disease crisis. Today, more than one in two U.S. adults lives with a chronic health condition, diseases that disproportionately impact communities of color. The burden of this disease has made COVID-19 especially devastating in America. Addressing this issue uh, will require broad and focused action that extends beyond medicine to really get at the roots of inequity and illness. Today, we have a stellar set of panelists who will help us better understand these challenges and start to outline some of the steps we can be taking to address it. I'm gonna provide some short intros for our panelists for the sake of time, but there's more information available on their background in their bios that's on the website. So our panelists today include Dr. Elise Adams, who is Professor of Epidemiology and Population Health at Stanford Medicine. Dr. Adams focuses on racial and socioeconomic disparities in chronic disease uh, treatment outcomes. Her interdisciplinary research seeks to evaluate the impact of changes in drug coverage policy on access to essential medications, to understand the drivers of disparities in treatment adherence among insured populations, and to test strategies for maximizing the benefits of treatment outcomes while minimizing harms through informed decision making. We also have David Saunders, who is director of the Office of Health Equity at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Mr. Saunders has 30 years of nonprofit management experience and brings with him extensive knowledge in the fields of education, public health, disparities, and youth development. He has been tasked with the massive effort of, of developing a collective response to COVID-19 and the implications of the pandemic on vulnerable populations within the Commonwealth. Last, we have Dr. Amina Seishamani, who is director of the Center for Medicare at, at the Center for Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services. She has broad ranging experience and expertise in areas, in many areas, and as background as a healthcare executive, health economist, physician, and health policy expert. So we're so pleased to have this just amazing group of experts join us for our discussion today. So I want to start us off today with a really broad ranging question to really help set the stage for the discussion. So we really have had significant focus on inequities that have been exposed by the pandemic but that have existed and really been documented for decades. So I'd really like to start by thinking about and hearing from you and your unique roles and perspectives about what health equity looks like to you. How would you assess or measure progress toward achieving health equity as, as we strive uh, to address these disparities and move to greater equity? Um, and I'll start with Dr. Adams. Sure, so um, thank you so much for that introduction. So much of our work um, in my own group really focuses on the healthcare system, but we realize that healthcare is not, is just part of the, the equation in terms of addressing health inequities. But I would say in terms of an equitable society, I think it would be one in which the outcomes that we see for individuals are, um, it, it would have to equal opportunity for um, positive healthcare outcomes. So for example, when we look at the healthcare system right now, we know that some groups have worse outcomes even when they have equal access to care. So equal access is part of the equation, but not enough, right? We also know that where you live determines your health outcomes. 
not seeing these dramatic differences in chronic disease outcomes, first of all, risk of chronic disease, but also the outcomes of those chronic diseases based on where you live is what we'd like to see in terms of more equitable healthcare outcomes. And then certainly within the healthcare system, what we really hope is that ultimately when people come into the healthcare system, they know that their care is going to be personalized to them, but that also that they have equal opportunity to have positive outcomes from that experience as, as anyone else, um, and certainly not based on non-clinical factors like the color of your skin or where you come from. Dr. Seishamani, what does uh, health equity look like to you and how do we me measure progress towards that goal? Great, well, first, thank you so much for having me. It's great to, to be on this panel talking about these issues. Um, starting off for CMS, um, our vision is to serve the public as a trusted partner and steward dedicated to advancing health equity, expanding coverage and improving health outcomes. And health equity is a key pillar for us for achieving that vision. Um, COVID-19, as you know, you've mentioned, has really exacerbated inequities in our system. And so that means that we have to look at everything we do through the lens of equity. So asking how are we promoting health equity as our first question, never the last, and having that lens for all policy and implementation decisions. Um, and what do I mean by this? When we think about how we want to change care for people, for families, for communities, you know, when we look at our um, care transformation models, like our Medicare shared savings program, we wanna see where are there opportunities to leverage a program like that to further um, health equity, along with seeing where we can drive high quality person-centered care and where we can promote affordability and sustainability. Um, also, when we think about transparency, data, providing data, reporting, oversight, all of those are important aspects of health equity because when the system doesn't work, when there are cracks, it's our most vulnerable populations that are the ones who are the most likely to fall through. So really thinking about everything we do through that lens. And that also comes to where we can break down barriers to care, where we can lift up our underserved community and support providers that disproportionately serve um, those populations as well. Um, because again, you know, we're in the greatest public health emergency in generations and really no one should be left out or left behind. And so really being able to incorporate that into absolutely everything that we do. Thanks so much, Mr. Saunders. Sure, and um, I want to also thank you all for reaching out all the way to Pennsylvania to have me here uh, today. This pandemic has highlighted what we've known for some time, um, but we have not been able to satisfactorily uh, address disparities in cancer, uh, kidney disease, lung diseases, diabetes, and heart conditions, uh, just to name a few of the underlying health conditions have reduced life expectancy uh, for many years um, and have put certain communities in, in the crosshairs of uh, this pandemic. So equity looks like neighborhoods in low resource areas having access to fruits and vegetables, uh, affordable safe housing, communities free from violence and, and trauma, access to quality healthcare, uh, and higher wage positions, just like the residents in more affluent environs. And given that this is a mere dream, um, that those of us in position to make a difference, uh, take action, uh, take into account these inequities and do our best to level the field. Thank you. Great, so we've started with this vision and the goal of health equity. I'd like to now take us back to the present situation of where we are today. Um, and Elise, I'll actually go back to you. If you can provide a little bit of context on the state of chronic disease in America today and what the disparities look like in that and who's most affected by chronic disease. Certainly, thank you so much. So first of all, I think it's really important to understand that um, the most common chronic condition is multiple chronic conditions. Very rarely do people have just one chronic condition. So we really, first of all, have to think outside of disease silos and really think about the whole person and the challenges that someone faces when they're actually battling multiple chronic conditions at one time. 
The other reality that I think we have to face is that we know that communities of color, low income people and others are at much higher risk, not only of um, being diagnosed with these chronic conditions, but also being diagnosed at an earlier stage of life. So for example, in midlife, as opposed to an, an, an older life. And that has a huge impact on your ability to earn, the impact on your family caregiving, the impact on sort of your overall survival, as well as your long-term health. And so what we often see are much higher rates of morbidity, so early hospitalization, devastating financial costs of these hospitalizations, as well as early disability, as well as mortality related to these conditions. One example is, of course, of diabetes, where we see much, much higher rates, particularly of type 2 diabetes um, among, in midlife among African Americans, for example, as opposed to maybe sort of after age 65 among many other populations. And that has a devastating impact, a long-lasting impact on any number of aspects of life for these communities. Thanks so much. So I think there really has been growing recognition of the role that social determinants of health play in driving a lot of the inequities we see. David, can you talk a little bit about how both historical and contemporary racism and discrimination underlie a lot of these inequities we see across these social and economic factors and then tie that all back to how that um, influences the patterns we see in chronic disease? Sure, let me um, point you to a resource from our sister agency, the Department of Human Services here in Pennsylvania. Uh, they've worked in conjunction uh, with the Department of Health, specifically uh, my office. If you Google the Pennsylvania Health Equity Analysis Tool, you'll find there among so much more an overlay of redlining. So that's, uh, I think, a, a pretty clear example of how governmental policy has impacted communities across many spectrums, not the least of which are health outcomes. And, and, and many of the participants on the line, I'm sure have heard and understand uh, how uh, redlining has affected communities. There are communities in our state of Pennsylvania and others as well that live in one community uh, where life expectancy can range between 15 and 20 years less compared to living just a, just a few blocks away. And it, and it does come down to where we live, work and play. I mean, our health behaviors, which impact our, the health outcomes that we enjoy or, 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 or suffer from, unfortunately, have a lot to do with where we live. And if we are cordoned off, um, and, and only can live in certain communities, well, our, our access to proper health care and, and all the things that I mentioned a little bit earlier are harder to come by. Um, the good thing is we can change this phenomenon. Uh, and it begins with recognition, uh, which this tool provides. I mean, it's, 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 it's clearly laid out. Um, and then action based upon the information that's, that's in front of us. Great. Elise, is there any more you would want to add on the role of racism and discrimination? Gosh, I mean, it's, it, it's, um, it has such a big impact on so many things. Um, I think as David was saying, it's had this sort of compounding effect over time, right? So it's not enough to just sort of say, yes, we know racism and discrimination are problematic, but it is, it is interwoven into the fabric of our policies and practices and how we treat each other in ways that perpetuates itself over time. And so really thinking about not just sort of how do we stop overt discrimination and racism, but how do we weed it out within this sort of, this sort of interlaid within these policies and change um, the power dynamics such that those people who have not traditionally had a voice in, the, in this country are able to have that voice. And part of that, I believe, means going back and providing communities with the capacity to advocate for themselves, right? So it's not enough for those of us outside of those communities to advocate for them. We also have to give them the capacity to advocate for themselves because I think that's really critical because they such a, play such a critical role in terms of disease prevention in the first place. Thank you. Mina, America's Aging baby boomer population represents one of the most significant demographic shifts in our country's history. Each day, roughly 10,000 people are celebrating their 65th 
birthdays, knowing that this risk of chronic disease increases with age and that there are deep inequities among seniors today, how is CMS thinking about disease prevention, early intervention, and addressing disparities for this group? So in leading Medicare, I want our work to advance health equity, drive high quality person-centered care, and promote affordability and sustainability. That's really where I am um, focusing and where my team is galvanized. We need innovations to meet people where they are and innovations that are also safe and bring better care to people in a more affordable and sustainable way. And I'm committed to ensuring we do it in partnership with our beneficiaries. They really have to be at the center of everything that we do. More specifically, COVID-19 has really shown the importance of advancing health equity and driving high quality person-centered care. And to address disparities, especially within the context of the continuing pandemic, we need to continue to focus on vaccinations, on behavioral health, and on care transformation. So kind of three examples of you know, where there are opportunities here. So first with vaccines, we're doing everything we can to remove barriers, giving access to a third dose with no out-of-pocket costs for Medicare um, beneficiaries, increasing payments to providers to vaccinate people with Medicare who have difficulty leaving their homes, um, and ensuring that healthcare workers who work with people who have Medicare, that they get vaccinated to protect um, health and safety. On behavioral health, we have expanded access to telehealth services for beneficiaries with mental health disorders um, in our physician proposed physician fee schedule. You know, I know firsthand as a physician how enabling someone to engage from their home who before had to take several buses to get to a clinic, you know, it can make an extraordinary difference in being able to access healthcare and improve quality of life. And on care transformation, you know, we're very committed to continuing this movement. You know, the pandemic accelerated innovations in telehealth, in care in the home. It also showed that better care coordination, providing care not just within the four walls of a hospital or office visit, you know, but across the experiences of a person is really key to keeping people healthy. We have programs at CMS from the you know, merit-based incentive system that's our foundation of the physician um, fees to this Medicare shared savings program where you have accountable care organizations of providers coordinating care to improve quality and reduce cost to some of our more vanguard models in our innovation center. All of these programs, you know, along with Medicare Advantage need to be aligned and coordinated and done in partnership with everybody else who works in this space to improve our coordinated models, to bring more beneficiaries under these models, to work with providers to be able to transform care, because that is the way that we're gonna be able to move towards keeping people healthy, you know, utilizing prevention, addressing chronic disease, all with that underlying lens of addressing disparities and advancing equity. David, as it relates uh, to chronic disease and health equity in Pennsylvania, what are some of the specific challenges that you're dealing with right now in your state? And what are, what are some of your top priorities as a director of the Office of Health Equity? You know, Pennsylvania is a unique state. Um, I spent about 17 years um, in California. And uh, California, of course, is much bigger than uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and, and, and quite different. Um, we have a, a major city here, of course, in the state of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is its own jurisdiction. So our influence um, over that city is minimal. Uh, Philadelphia gets its, its, its funding uh, at, you know, at the federal level so, so working with the city of brotherly love um, is extremely important with our influence, um, unfortunately, is, is, is minimal. And the fact that many of the health disparities uh, come from Philadelphia um, is, is, is something that I'm, I'm constantly working through. We have a very rural geography. So when I say, you know, Pennsylvania, is, is, is so unique, 
um, you know, between 75 and 80 percent of the population here, of our, geogra our geography here, is rural. Um, mostly Caucasian, um, but many of these rural communities uh, have industry that is left. I mean, so so coal and, and, and steel and, and, and lumber. So the economy has changed and, and, and that has impacted health. Um, you know, the, the geography of those rural communities tend to uh, make transportation to healthcare um, difficult. Um, internet connectivity has proven to be um, quite an issue. I mean, it's something that, that this uh, Commonwealth has been addressing for some time or, or seeking to address for some time, but the, but the benefit of, of, of telehealth um, and the need for telehealth is really um, kind of highlighted the importance of that internet connectivity. And not every rural community in Pennsylvania has high speed internet. So that is a issue. So that access to care um, and an inter and that connectivity is, is clearly an issue. Uh, we have counties here in the state of Pennsylvania. Many of you are, are familiar with the county health rankings. And we have many counties here or some counties here that are highly ranked, you know, between one and 10, one and 15. But within those counties, you have communities, smaller communities that are not doing so well. So you'll have you know, these grand numbers, but in some counties, you'll have those small pockets of a, of a community and they tend to be along, in many cases, racial and ethnic uh, minority lines that are not doing so well. So to focus in on those particular communities is, is always uh, very high on our list. Our top priorities going forward um, is, to, is to, of course, focus in on the short and long-term effects of COVID-19. We have uh, been blessed with, with the federal funding, which, which many states have, um, to allow us to address over at least the next two or three years uh, some of those short-term as well as long-term effects of COVID. Uh, we want to use the momentum from the pandemic to position you know, uh, the efforts around health equity going forward. We don't want it to, to, to lose steam. And beyond that, outside of COVID-19, there are the perennial issues. Um, I think one thing that has been exacerbated um, due to COVID-19 is um, the issue of violence. Um, there are cities in, in Pennsylvania that have uh, high levels of violence, and that's going to be an ongoing issue. The focus on the aging population, Nina discussed uh, that, that was, that was mentioned earlier, and always, uh, you know, maternal and infant mortality, I don't want to delineate the numbers there, um, the, the disparities are, 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 are sad uh, for, for maternal and infant mortality, um, and something that we need to continuously address. Thank you so much. So Mina, we know that the majority of healthcare spending in the US continues to go toward treatment of disease versus prevention. Can you talk through what you think some of the main factors are that contribute to this pattern and how we maybe need to be changing incentives to um, get more of that investment going toward prevention and what the impact would be of investing more in prevention? Um, thank you. And to come back to a prior theme on care transformation and value-based care, I think that really remains critically important. I mentioned our um, program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program or Accountable Care Organizations, where providers come together to better coordinate and manage care to improve quality and lower costs. We have 12 million beneficiaries in these programs and they continue to improve on quality and they continue to also save money for the Medicare program. Most recently, we'll be distributing almost $2.3 billion in shared um, savings to these organizations. And this is occurring even through COVID. Um, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of these accountable care organizations 
quickly pivoted to providing telehealth and team-based services that were needed to address the range of issues that the pandemic um, created. They invested in care managers, in community health workers who could provide support that was so important for communities who were struggling to stay healthy during the pandemic. Um, aside from these models, there's also a role for specific payments that promote value and that underlie these, um, these models. So over the last several years, Medicare has become, begun paying for a number of preventive and care management services. Um, for example, the welcome to Medicare visit for people new to Medicare, the annual wellness visit, you know, services that can help promote good health um, and prevent disease and have early detection of disease, as well as you know, paying for a number of chronic care management services. Um, so bringing all of that together, you know, I think it's worth emphasizing how we have to encourage innovation and transformation in care delivery across the gamut from our payment rules to some of these care models that are operated out of our center, the Center for, center for Medicare, and also out of the Innovation Center, and being able to have shared learning collaboratives so that we can evaluate and harness the lessons that we are learning, especially during this time. So, you know, being able to have partnerships across CMS but also with the rest of the healthcare community. You know, I know as a physician and a former health system executive, how it can be if a provider is approached with multiple ways of getting to the same goal and the confusion that that can create. We need to create partnerships and alignment where we can all learn together. We can understand where there's opportunities for improvement, understand what works and what doesn't so that we're all rowing in the same direction and we're all supporting our beneficiaries and providers as care delivery is transformed on the ground. Elise or David, is there anything you would wanna add on shifting us more to prevention focused system? Dr. Adams, you wanna go first? Oh, sure. I was just gonna, um, I think, echo what Mina had said earlier too about the involvement of our communities in that innovation. Right, so we do a lot, and from a researcher perspective, we focus a lot about on the, on the evidence that's in existence about what works in terms of prevention, which is incredibly helpful. I think it's incredibly helpful to identify sort of evidence-based initiatives and meaningful goals for setting around prevention. But what's incredibly critical is the engagement of communities and patients and other stakeholders in those interventions. Because really a lot of the work that has to happen, as Mina mentioned earlier, actually happens outside of the healthcare system. So focusing only on the healthcare system and only on healthcare providers won't get us to where we need to be. And really those communities are experts in the knowledge that they have within the community about what the factors are that David mentioned earlier in terms of the factors within their communities that also adversely affect their health. So without that engagement, I, I worry that innovation only within the healthcare sector, for example, isn't going to get us to where we need to go. I think, um, again, just to reinforce what David and me have already said, that engagement of our communities and, and reinforcing and building capacity within our communities to be critical and equal partners in that work is, is really going to be what pushes us forward. And I'll double down on that. So our um, health equity response team has been meeting since April of 2020, and it is a group that includes academia, healthcare, nonprofit organizations, uh, state agencies like, like mine. And it, it does help to have all of us at the table. I mean, we're still meeting every other week. We have a meeting tomorrow. Um, every other week we get on the line for an hour and we share information, we share resources, but that alignment that coordination, um, that continued perseverance, if you will, and kind of keeping at it to not lose that momentum. I mean, really that's, that's what will hopefully help down the line, you know, prevent, um, you know, such a, such a disparity as it relates to chronic conditions. I'm gonna age myself here a little bit. Um, you know, prevention has been a top, discussion point for many years and we still um, are not necessarily putting all of our as many resources as we possibly could towards prevention when we know there is an ROI on the other end of it 
but that's not always clearly seen from the from the beginning. So that investment is not necessarily, uh, in my opinion, where where it should, where it should be. Mm-hmm. Um, Elise, I'd like to go back on this point you've raised about the importance of community and really enhancing the capacity of community to engage in these issues. Are the resources there to support that or or where are there gaps in terms of resources in supporting building capacity within community? Oh, I think the resources are definitely there. I think it's a matter of shifting the power dynamics such that we put more in the hands of the community so that they can, again, be equal partners in the work. So just as one example, um, Stanford Cancer Institute recently developed um, in partnership with VISA this um, community seed grant program that basically awards grants to the community to design interventions around cancer prevention, right? So the community is the lead. We as researchers are support staff to them and we work together to implement evidence-based strategies around prevention, right? So that's the idea. And that's definitely something we want to grow and we want to continue doing. And again, I think the resources are out there, but what we tend to do is we go to the known quantities. So for example, I'm a researcher at Stanford University, right? And when, and when a funder sees Stanford University, they think, oh, well, they can do things. I want to give them money to do great things, which is fantastic. We want those dollars to do good things. However, I think we also need to think about how can we lift up our communities, the communities that we serve, in ways that allow them to help drive us, right? So it's not just us driving the bus, really. It's really sort of us providing them with resources and capacity building within our communities to have them teach us. I will say, so one of the most wonderful partnerships I've ever had as in the last 20 years of being a researcher in this field is with patients and caregivers and patient advocates because they, they see everything through a different lens. And the work becomes so much more impactful when you can talk to people about whom you're researching these these issues and hear from them about what the struggles are. It's one thing for me as a researcher to read about it. They've lived it. And so to ignore that lived experience is really, I think, a mistake on our part. And so again, I think the resources are there. We just need to continue to encourage others to, to take on these types of initiatives really evaluate them from the perspective of the community about the partnership and make sure it's an equal partnership and really do more of that leading, allowing the community to lead us as opposed to the other way around in ways that can lead us, I think, to a better place in terms of actually being able to implement some of these strategies and have them sustained over the long term. Thanks. I think those are really important insights as we start thinking through and moving more towards solutions. Um, So I want to turn now to some questions we've gotten in uh, live from our audience. Uh, The first one um, I'll pose to the group, so any of you can chime in if you have something to contribute. So we talked some about the implications of chronic disease and the pandemic um, for people of color. There is a question specific to immigrants and in terms of the types of patterns we see among immigrant communities and also then uh, the children of immigrants and subsequent generations. So if anyone can kind of speak to um, some of the issues we see in terms of chronic disease within the immigrant community and then how those patterns start to shift as we look at subsequent generations. And I'll let you all choose who wants to jump in first. I'll give it a shot. Um, what I am encouraging, you know, our community, the larger health equity community within the the state of Pennsylvania to recognize is that, uh, you know, Pennsylvania is going to change. It has changed. Our Latino population has increased um, close to a million. I know that doesn't mean anything to to, to the state of California, which is much, much larger than that. But for here in Pennsylvania, I mean, it's pretty, pretty big. Um, Out of 13 million folks, a million uh, from the Latino population, and there are various other immigrant communities that are that are here. Their 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 families are coming. They're not going back to wherever they came from. So we need to to recognize that and to make sure that our um, healthcare community has has people that can speak those languages, understand the cultures. Uh, from those immigrant communities and be creative in, in, in ways that 
can hopefully reduce some of the burden um, that these communities are, are, are dealing with, understanding that the trauma that in many cases they are, you know, coming to our community, our, our, our state with, all those things, I think we need to kind of take it up a notch, if you will, with that understanding that this is a different kind of world that I know here in the state of Pennsylvania where we're dealing with a, and just to, um, you know, a, a account for those changes. I would hardly agree with that. I would also say that in addition to language, um, there is the issue where we have um, such diversity within our immigrant communities. And that diversity is beautiful and brings us amazing cultural richness to Northern California. It also complicates, you know, thinking about being responsive to those communities. So just to give a couple of examples here in our sort of catchment area for the kids, they have a cancer institute, for example, we have the Salinas Valley and the San Joaquin Valley, both of which are very rich agricultural regions and provide a lot of the produce that everyone in, in the America enjoys, right? It comes from, comes from these two places. Yet in the San Joaquin Valley, many communities, disproportionately Latinx communities, have trouble getting access to drinkable water. In the Salinas Valley, they're incredibly concerned about pesticide exposure, particularly in the agricultural fields, right? And then when we look at our Asian communities, we often talk about the Asian community sort of writ large, but the reality is there's a rich textual diversity among Asian communities. So if we look, for example, in the Salinas Valley and in sort of other parts of our, of our, of our catchment area, as well as in the um, closer to Stanford in the Palo Alto area, we have many immigrant populations from the Philippines um, and other places. We also have one of the largest Tongan communities in the United States. And that richness and diversity requires us not only to be mindful of being able to speak Tagalog or the Tonkin language, but also to understand the needs of those communities with respect to prevention. So some of the work that we're doing is partnering, for example, with the Tonkin community to design social media interventions, really targeting Tongan culture and trying to integrate prevention of cancer within those contexts, right? But it does require more of us, and rightly so, in order to be responsive to those communities. Um, and it, I would sort of add on top of that, you think about children and, and the experiences of children, when you add on immigration policies that are highly punitive and frightening for families, you can just imagine what that does in terms of someone's incentive to reach out when they need healthcare, if they're concerned about being undocumented and the impact that that's gonna have on our families. So it's incredibly compounded the issues related to our immigrant populations and that's on us to better understand their needs and to partner with them to meet those needs. Um, so I think there's really been growing recognition of the toll the pandemic is starting to take on mental health or has been taking on mental health now over the past year and a half to close to two years. How should we be thinking about mental health when the, in the context of the underlying disease that is already present and the new challenges that it prevents, presents? What kind of interventions do we think are going to be necessary um, in the years to come in terms of thinking about this? And Mina, do you want to start with this one? Sure. I mean, I will just say that everything that was said about the immigrant community, I just wholeheartedly agree. And it really comes back to thinking about everything we do through this lens of equity, being acutely and proactively aware and cognizant of culture and um, language and also just underlying expectations, assumptions, et cetera, that, you know, exist throughout. And, you know, I think that also ties into discussions about behavioral health, right? Like we need to think about behavioral health as part of what we do to care for people, what we do to care for communities, and really be able to think about how we can best support and in improve access. And to piggyback off of something that Dr. Adams had said, you know, addressing behavioral health is not just about a specific behavioral health provider in a specific behavioral health clinic visit. It really is thinking about wellness. It's thinking about the, the, the team-based approach to care where a community health worker may have a really good understanding of what somebody is struggling with or dealing with or being successful in tackling 
than someone else might and being able to harness that richness um, of perspectives and skill sets and um, diversity as we are trying to support our communities. And this again comes back to where, where there are opportunities to really create that team-based approach to care, to promote that integration and coordination so that we're really addressing the full experiences of people and not just you know individual episodes. I'll jump in. Um, I think destigmatizing mental health um, is one place to start. Uh, Mina, who I think was alluding to, you know, the, the 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 coordination and the alignment between mental health and and and, and physical health. I think um, that's important as 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 well. Um, I think recognizing all the stress that that all of us have been under um for for these 18 months and you know and the ongoing issue that that's going to cause let's just say magically at the end of this year the numbers are are, are, are low and you know we're not we're not so worried as we are now about the delta variant and 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 and, and, and where we are with COVID 19 um, it's still going to take some time for us to um, move beyond a, a pandemic that's killed over 700,000 people and that have, have, you know, altered the way we go about our business and, and the social isolation, and, you know, and, and all those things is, is, is so, so to recognize it, um, you know, put programs and activities in, in place to address it, destigmatize uh, mental health, especially in, in those communities where mental health is not something that's, you know, has been a, a top priority, specifically in racial ethnic minority populations, probably those immigrant populations we talked about earlier as well, specifically, um, you know, addressing that stigma and, 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 and being creative to, um, you know, increase the service level uh, for mental health. Elise, is there anything you would add? No, just to underscore David's point, I think one of the things we often do in this country is we carve out mental health, right? We carve out for all sorts of reasons, expensive reasons and all sorts of reasons, but you carve it out. And what that, what that means is that not only do we already have stigma that prevents people from reaching out, but when they do reach out for mental health, we're gonna put them through extra hoops to get it to get the services they need, right? So we're already putting up barriers to something that's already hard for people to ask for. We've got to figure out a better way to do that, to provide those services. We also probably need to start thinking about beyond sort of our typical medical model, um, how can we provide people with the services that they need? So many people have benefited, for example, from psychotropic medications um, to treat mental health disorders, absolutely. And it's critical, but it's not the only thing that we know is effective in battling some of these conditions. And so really thinking about what are those social supports, what, you know, sort of whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or mind or meditation or what, whatever those other additional things that we could be doing, exercise, for example, huge in depression, right? But we don't think about it holistically we think about it as a prescription for X, right? And I think we need to think a little bit more broadly as we're prescribing a mental health treatment, in addition to making it easier to get, is thinking about more holistically based on that person's individual needs, based on their cultural, their cultural sort of uh, belonging, sort of where they need to, where they seek care naturally, thinking about where those social supports that they have and need, and thinking about prescribing it sort of more holistically for the whole person rather than script by script. Thank you so much. That brings us back to the point again about learning from and listening to community. Um, so I want to shift now thinking a little bit more about the healthcare provider side of things. Can you speak to programs that currently exist um, to help increase the pipeline of providers that are serving underserved communities? Um, and how can we expand these programs going forward? Who wants to start here? I'll start off by saying that's a little bit outside of my purview. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, Mina or Elise has something on that one. Well, I, um, I will say it's 
um, through our health resources and services administration, there's the National Health Service Corps. We have our teaching health centers program that was created in the Affordable Care Act. So there are, you know, definitely programs out there to, you know, uh, train, promote um, providers uh, in um, underserved areas and and specifically also people coming from those communities, you know, to improve our diversity, understanding perspectives. Um, so certainly there's always more work to be done. And this is an important piece. The provider side and the workforce side is a very important piece of the puzzle. And Elena, I would just, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in starting earlier, right? So I think we've learned over and over again that reaching out to people after they've already made a decision about whether or not to go to medical school or they're already sort of um, entrenched somewhere is too late. We need to get to people earlier. And so we're, we're developing relationships. Again, Stanford has relationships with Meharry Medical College, but also with um, Stillman College, which is actually does not have its own medical school but we reach out to undergraduates to give them opportunities to come and learn about science and medicine when they're undergraduates and just thinking about maybe they would like to go to medical school one day, or maybe they would like to become a scientist one day. So really sort of creating that pathway for people and introducing it very, very early so that we can actually increase the numbers coming in. And then I think we also need to think again, going back to this wellness issue, the wellness of our clinicians. I just gave a talk last week to some medical school res some residents, excuse me, not medical school students, but residents. Um, and it was the first time after, I think, the, my third year of talking about health policy with this group that I heard pessimism. A lot of pessimism about the future of medicine, about what it means to be a doctor in this day and age. And it really struck me that we have a whole cadre of people out there who are really not sure about what their lives are gonna be like, how, what it's gonna be like to have a career in medicine right now. And so we really need to be thinking about that. How can we retain these individuals in the profession, make sure that we provide them with the additional stimulation and other supports that they need to make us a meaningful career and continuing going forward. Right. So we're coming close to the end of our time together today. Um, I do wanna end with some forward thinking um, discussion. So I'll ask each of you, um, you know, what we've talked about today, obviously there's so much work to be done. A lot of it is gonna require a long-term sustained effort. But really, what do you think are the most important things or the most important thing we can be doing right now to tackle many of these issues that we talked about today? So David, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, um, at the macro level, uh, addressing the political determinants of health. Uh, Dawes developed um, this, this concept and it really looks at, um, you know, the fact that at the federal, state, and, and local level, the decisions as to where funding goes, you know, um, you know how things are, are, are structured is really the determining factor um, on the ground level as to how healthy a particular community is going to be. Um, but then individual efforts um, are also important. Um, our individual agency efforts, you know, one thing that we're doing here, uh, or trying to do here in Pennsylvania is to braid funding uh, focused in on specific communities. So, so placed-based efforts um, are extremely important looking at uh, how we can uh, turn the tide in, in, in low income communities that, that we are aware of um, and focus uh, various agencies and various organizations, resources directly on those particular communities. Mina, some thoughts on steps we should be taking now? Uh, yes, we all need to partner together. You know, if we're gonna advance our shared goals around health equity, around high quality person-centered care around affordability and sustainability, we're only going to be able to do it by working together. So that includes data, you know, the driving innovation, efforts to fight COVID-19, improving behavioral health, engaging and empowering caregivers, as we've discussed here, both within and outside of the traditional healthcare system. Um, so really it is a it is a team-based approach um, that we all need to need to work together. And you know, just for those in the audience um, who are providers, 
Thank you for taking good care of your patients and communities. I mean, that is that is ultimately the foundation upon which this entire conversation rests. Um, and Elise, you got our last word today. Yeah, just to underscore what, what was said just now about partnership. And I think we really need to think about what structures can we either put in place or dismantle that allow us to sustain those partnerships? Because what COVID taught us is we can't take down walls and we can't work together when we need to. So how do we continue to do that and how do we spread it to the benefit of our communities? Um, well, I wanna end by thanking all of our panelists for taking the time to share their expertise and thoughts with us today. Uh, it's been a really great discussion and I think um, given us a lot to think about both in terms of understanding the scope and scale of the problem, but also on where we really should be focused on efforts forward to address these challenges. Um, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. I'm gonna uh, shift things back now to Dean Levin. Thank you, Samantha. And thanks to the panelists for a really wonderful and thought-provoking discussion. I've learned a lot from that and great to hear about the work you're all doing uh, on the front lines uh, of COVID.